Welcome to the Touch MBA Admissions Podcast. Do you need help figuring out which schools to apply to or how to get into the world's top MBA programs? Hey, you're not alone. Join thousands of others on this podcast and on our site, touchmba.com, as they seek the admissions edge. And now, here's your host, Darren Joe. Welcome, everyone, to the show. This is your host, Darren. And today, I have a very special guest, Mr. Keegan Pierce, who is the Associate Director of International Admissions from Asade Business School in Spain. So, Keegan, could you tell us uh, a little bit uh, about yourself and, and your professional background? My pleasure, Darren, and thanks so much for having us on the show. Um, so uh, I'm originally from California. Um, I uh, did, as my undergraduate degree, international relations at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Uh, my career and actually my interest in football, soccer, call it what you like, took me to South Korea in 2002 when the Football World Cup was taking place there. I worked as a sports journalist in Korea for uh, almost a year and then got into sports management in the United States, uh, was working in that industry for about six years, some time in New York City, some time in Los Angeles. And at a certain point, I felt like I wanted to round out my management profile by getting a, a top MBA, looked at a number of schools, both in the US and in Europe. And uh, one of the schools that, well, the schools that caught my attention in general were some of the great MBA programs based in Spain. I, I applied to several of those, got admitted to them, and Esada was the one that, for me, at the end of the day, uh, stood out as, as a right fit with my goals and, my, and my, where, the areas in which I wanted to grow. Right after you graduated, you've been working in admissions as well, right? Ab no? ab absolutely. I, I finished my MBA in 2011, and at that point, an opportunity came up to be able to work with Esada's admissions department. Uh, I really enjoyed my MBA experience. Um, really believe in what the school stands for and uh, the kind of environment that they have here. And Barcelona is obviously a lovely city in which to live as well. So when the opportunity came to stay, I, I jumped at it. That's great. So you're the perfect person uh, to have on the show as you've been both a student and now, you know, obviously in admissions. You, you talked to us about how you were choosing between different programs in Spain. And what do you think makes the Asade MBA unique? I think at Asada you have a combination of a couple of factors. Um, first, you have an intimate sized MBA. Uh, our classes are a maximum uh, of 180 students. And so people who do the MBA here uh, really get to know uh, their classmates very well. Also, Barcelona is one of the top global cities actually in terms of um, uh, the number of, of full-time MBA students. Uh, and so it means that top companies are always looking for talent and they particularly seem to like Asade graduates uh, for a number of things that we can talk about later on in the conversation. So you've got top companies, you've got an intimate size program, you've got a really diverse group, uh, which, is, which is quite interesting. And there's also this collaborative spirit at Asade. And, and I know collaboration is one of those words that you'll see on the marketing material for pretty much every MBA out there. Uh, so uh, I think in terms of Asade, instead of me uh, just saying it, you people should try to learn more about the school or talk to someone who's gone here, and I'm sure you can find more of what that's about. Yeah, I mean, what are the benefits of going to a program with, like you said, has about 180 students per intake versus a program that has you know 500 students per intake? There, there are a couple of different benefits. One is that you get a chance to know your classmates well. Uh, by the time you finish the program at Asade, you will know uh, pretty much everybody in your class, some better than others, obviously, but they're really part of a, a strong network that you have firsthand. Uh, you, that's complemented by the fact that uh, our school is both a law school and a business school that has undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate programs. And so you're still part of a larger school network. In our case, it's uh, about 47,000 former students that we have worldwide. Um, and so you're part of a huge network, but a really small MBA group. And within that group, you get a chance to stand out when it comes time for top companies uh, to be coming to, to campus looking for internships or looking for full-time recruitment. You mentioned Asade's you know, focus on collaboration and unique culture of collaboration. 
Um, but for those people who might not have a chance to visit the program in Barcelona and you know, actually sit in on the class, could you just elaborate a little more on, on what that means? Of course. So we, what we try to do is to leverage the diversity that we have. You know, right now our first year class is about 160 students and they've got nearly 50 nationalities uh, represented, which is tremendous diversity. And we try to leverage that diversity by having people working together in teams as much as possible. Uh, you do anywhere between 80 to 90 percent of your, uh, your work in the MBA in a teamwork setting. And uh, there are a lot of MBA programs that try to use the element of individual competition to get people to sort of struggle or fight against each other within a classroom setting to see if they can come out on top. Uh, our philosophy is that MBAs are competitive type A personalities uh, to begin with. And the best thing that a program can do instead of turning up the fire on that individual competition is to create incentives for people to collaborate with each other in a, in a teamwork setting. So you and your team are struggling together to be the best team in the class as opposed to you just trying to be the only best individual uh, student in the entire class. It's a, it's a small detail, but it's one that we feel makes a big difference. Yeah, that is a huge percentage of classwork that is team oriented. And you often, you'll be switching teams, right, throughout, throughout the MBA. That's absolutely right. During your first year of the program, uh, you have three quarters or three trimesters. And uh, during each of those, you will be with a different team. It's you plus four or five other individuals who most likely will be of different nationalities, different academic backgrounds, different uh, job experiences from yourself. Uh, no matter how much you love your current team, you can't hang on to it when it's time to switch at the end of the quarter. And no matter how much you hate your current team, you can't <laughs> switch before it's time to change. Because the idea is that this is the environment in which you do a lot of the learning um, and a lot of the growing that takes place during the MBA. It's a very interesting approach. And I also noticed that at Asade, it's one of the few, if not the only MBA programs where candidates can either be there for 12, 15, or 18 months. That's right. We have a, there's a flexible, flexible structure to the program because we, we recognize that as much as MBAs cost in monetary terms, the real biggest cost is the opportunity cost of not working. Um, and people don't always have the same goals when, uh, in terms of how long they want an MBA to last. Oftentimes they don't even have the same goals when they start the MBA from when they finish the MBA. And so uh, not only do we allow people to pick how quickly they want to finish the experience, either 12, 15 or 18 months, as you said, but you don't make that decision until nine months after you start the program. And so it really means that you're able to make an informed decision uh, by the end of the month of May, having started in the previous September, whether you want to do a summer internship or not whether you want to work on a business plan or not, uh, whether you feel like going on exchange to one of our exchange partner schools or not. So that's, uh, that's part of the philosophy behind this, uh, this flexibility that's built into our program. Do most MBA candidates stay for 15 months or is it you know, pretty equally spread in terms of you know, students choosing to do 12 months, 15 months, 18 months? We've had this format for about uh, three years now. My, my class was actually the very first class that got a chance to, um, uh, to, to do it. And the numbers have been pretty much the same over the years in the sense that uh, you have a group of somewhere between 10 to 15 people who will choose to do the fast track option uh, and do it in 12 months. Those are primarily people who know exactly what they're going to be doing after the MBA. So not just what they want to do, but they have either a family business they're going to be working for or maybe a business they're looking to start up uh, or they've got a job that's waiting for them from a, a company that's often sponsoring their MBA. You then have a group of about maybe 50 to 60 people who choose the 15-month option. Um, and usually they want to get a leg up on the job market by being available in January as opposed to being available in the sort of early summer as most MBA programs are. But still the, the lion's share of people see this as a traditional full-time MBA format and they'll go with the 18-month option which allows you obviously more time to be able to work on your profile but it also gives you the option of both doing an internship and doing an international exchange without having to make any sacrifices along the way in terms of time. Thanks for clarifying that. You mentioned, you know, the large number of alumni that are related or involved with the Asade um, MBA and the program started in uh, 1964. That's right. right. A long time ago. And 
So I was wondering why, curriculum-wise, there was a focus on like family business, finance, and entrepreneurship. Yeah, so these are these labs are three areas in which we've found that there's a real demand, both from students and from the market, to gain further specialization. Finance is uh, is a clear traditional MBA area. It's an area in which we've seen an increase in our uh, of, in the placement of our students over the years, and we decided to bolster it by uh, by introducing the finance lab. Uh, to take a quick break here, the the lab is essentially an opportunity for people to do semi curricular activities throughout the course of the academic year. You um, are attending lectures, you're doing some extra work. These take place in the afternoons after you've finished your normal core courses. And if you complete a certain number of credits or activities within the labs, you gain a certificate at the end of it. So it's kind of like the equivalent of getting a, a minor in your, in your university within, let's say, the U.S. university system. So finance is, finance is one important one. It's led, led by a great guy named Pablo Triana, is one of our star professors. Then there is the, uh, the entrepreneurship lab, which uh, entrepreneurship is in the DNA of ESADE. In fact, the school was founded by entrepreneurs who were looking to improve the business climate in Europe and in Spain in general. And uh, finally, there's the family business lab, which uh, is led by a guy named Alberto Jimeno. Uh, we see more and more family business students uh, coming to Sade, and we really wanted to give them a resource that allowed people to focus more on that, on that area. I should mention also Jan Brinkman is the name of the guy who's in charge of the entrepreneurship lab, and that's a really popular option for students as well. Yeah, I've, I think there's a growing number of MBA candidates, especially from Asia where I'm based, you know, that are heavily involved in the family business. But um, so I think that's that's a smart move. Are there any new exciting developments with the program? There are a couple of things that we're really that we're really excited about. One is uh, our action learning program. Uh, we're based here on a brand new campus. Uh, we've moved into um, uh, this campus just as of last July, and so it hasn't even been a year that we've been here. Uh, it's it's essentially the international campus of the of the university. It shares facilities with our one year master's programs, uh, with our international undergraduate business program. And there are also a number of companies that are based here in a business incubator called Creopolis. And um, the Action Learning Program is something that students are already participating in from our first year class. It allows them to work on a consulting project with one of the firms that's based in Creopolis and uh, essentially puts into action many of the things that they've learned during the course of their first year course, uh, core courses. And it gives them different perspectives uh, on those learnings moving forward. Great. And most of those companies are startups? Most of them are startups. There are a few larger companies as well um, in industrial sectors, in finance sectors that have uh, either an innovation or a research and development department, which is based partially here at Creopolis. But the, there are over 70 companies that are here and primarily they're sort of early to middle growth companies uh, or startups directly. So I'm sure you're kicking yourself and asking uh, Sade, well, why couldn't you have built this building when, when I was going through the program? It's really spectacular <laughs> facilities, I think. I mean, uh, I, I look around at, at what our offices look like, what the classrooms look like, what the meeting rooms look like, and the kind of technology and space that they've got. And, and you can certainly see why uh, the decision was made to upgrade to this campus. So I think a lot of our audience you know, has heard about Barcelona that's really exciting, fun place to live, a center of commerce in Spain. But a lot um, of people have, have told me, well, Spain's going through an economic crisis right now with you know high unemployment rates, a shrinking economy in, in the past few years. So you know, why should candidates get their MBA in Barcelona and Spain now? It's interesting because as economic situation uh, has gotten tougher here in Spain, I think there's uh, there's absolutely no hiding from that fact, and and certainly the unemployment figure is what catches the biggest headlines right now. Uh, the, at the same time, the business schools in Spain have been making a steady increase in most of the the global rankings, and. Uh, I think the reasons behind that, there are a number of different reasons. One is that there are schools with a lot of tradition uh, that have been around for at least 50 years in the case of, uh, of, of some of the top schools. There, there are schools that offer not only quality education, but the opportunity to learn the Spanish language, which is one of the top three most spoken languages in the, in the world, depending on who you ask, it's either second or third behind Mandarin. 
And there, there are schools where, they, where people take international talent, put them in contact with an international MBA program, and then link them to international jobs afterwards. So in the case of Esale, uh, we have some of our best placement rates that we've had in the course of the past 10 years. So within three months of graduation, uh, about 93% of our graduates were already placed from our most recent graduating class. And at the same time, only about 10% of our graduates go on to work in Spain afterwards. So it's, it's really an attractive location and a really great quality of life where people can get a great education and then move on to work inside Spain if they're interested, but also in, in the great majority to work outside of Spain at some top locations and some top companies. And, you know, especially as uh, for you as an American, you know, having worked in Korea and then the U.S., and then now you're getting your MBA in Spain. I mean, what was your experience like applying for and looking, looking for jobs in Spain or outside Spain? I thought my most likely plan was to be getting the MBA and then returning to the U.S. where I was from so I could continue working in the sports sector or something to do with entertainment or media. And uh, along the way, I happened to absolutely love uh, the city of Barcelona. Uh, as you say, I've been fortunate enough to live uh, on four different continents. And I think this is one of the most special places on earth. It's got a really great combination of good lifestyle, uh, a very entrepreneurial and dynamic cosmo cosmopolitan feeling, uh, being a, a big city without being an overwhelming city. So when the opportunity came to, to move onwards, I really wanted to try to stay in Barcelona if possible. Uh, an opportunity came to be able to work here at the, at the university. Uh, like, like me, there are many students from Asade who try to stay in Spain afterwards. They're by no means the majority, but I think they're, they're a decent number. And people often find that they'll get job offers from Spain if they're interviewing here. The, the challenging moment comes when you're comparing a job offer from Spain from one that you have from Germany or the US uh, or an emerging market. And that's where everyone has to make their, their own decision of what their greatest priority is. It's also one of the reasons why as a Saudi, it's so important that we continue to have a diverse class and diverse recruiting options because we know that the natural, uh, the natural decision for everyone will not be necessarily staying in Barcelona or staying in Spain. I see, and, and how necessary is, is it to, to be fluent in Spanish to get you no know, job opportunities in, in, in Spain? I think like, like most countries, if you want to get a chance to work there afterwards, it's really helpful to learn the language. Um, it's not at all a requirement for doing the MBA, MBA here at Asada. Uh, there are people who arrive fluent in Spanish. There are people who arrive knowing no Spanish at all. Um, the classes are conducted in English and you have Spanish language courses that run throughout the entire MBA. And uh, we've got a uh, really high quality language education and uh, people who set themselves the goal uh, of taking great leaps in their Spanish during their time on campus can find that they'll go from knowing maybe just a few phrases to being able to participate in presentations or sometimes even elective classes in Spanish by the time their second year comes around. Well, I think that gives a pretty clear overview of, you know, what the strengths of the program are and what type of program it is. Um, if we can now sort of turn to the admission side of things. Of course. Um, clearly, diversity is, uh, is very important to Asade, but what type of candidate is, is Asade looking for? So we're looking for, for people who, who tick a number of different boxes. I mean, the, the basic requirements to be able to apply, the ones that you find on our website is having done your bachelor's degree, uh, having taken uh, either a GMAT or a GRE, uh, proving your fluency in English. Those are all sort of the, the, the basic requirements. Uh, beyond that, uh, what we're really trying to find from a candidate is that it's, it's somebody who understands how an MBA and how a SADE would fit into their future professional growth uh, and personal growth. That's something that you can learn not only from speaking with folks like us in admissions or looking at our website, but something we really encourage you to speak to current and former students about as well. Uh, we're looking for people who have made a strong progress uh, in their professional career. So people not necessarily who've gotten promoted every single year of their career, but we see them taking on increasing responsibilities and increasing challenges uh, throughout the course of their of their career. And uh, we're looking for people who have international experience. That doesn't necessarily mean that you need to have lived in 10 different countries, but 
that you've always tried to push yourself to get outside of your cultural comfort zone, whether that's in your own neighborhood, in your own country, or through lots of international experience. And then finally, somebody who, who understands what the collaborative environment is like here at Asade and is interested not just in taking from that, but in contributing to it at the same time. I noticed that your average sort of work experience for your last class, at least, was around six years of work experience. So um, what would you say to candidates who are on the lower end of, of the work experience scale? Maybe they have two, two years of work experience. I mean, I know every case is different, but you know, would you recommend that they get closer to that six years of work experience before applying or to just you know, apply if they really want to come? As you say, our, our average is, um, is, is five to six years, but uh, that has a pretty broad range. Uh, it goes anywhere from two, which is our minimum to apply, all the way up to about uh, nine, sometimes even 10 years of work experience. It's, it's another element of the diversity that we have within our classroom environment. So uh, I would encourage people who have, who have a, a lesser amount of work experience simply to ask themselves the question, is right now an ideal time for me to get an MBA? And if the answer is yes, as long as you have those two years or you will have two years by the time you start the program, then by all means, I'd encourage you to fill out an application and uh, allow us to get a better sense of your profile. That's a great answer. I love that. Is, is now the right time for me to get an MBA? Great stuff. In terms of your deadlines, I noticed that Asade has 10 different application deadlines. That's a ton. Um, we do. It's, it, it could very easily be called rolling admission, essentially. Okay. Uh, but yeah. we wanted to give people some kind of a structure with which they could, uh, they could shoot for and get their applications in by a certain date throughout the year. Having said that, we also do look at applications as they come in. Uh, we just wanted to give a minimum level of expectation uh, in terms of uh, by when you'd hear back from us, depending on when you've submitted your application. Okay, so yeah, if you wouldn't mind, could you let us know sort of what happens from the time an applicant you know, submits an application to when uh, they would hear back from, from you and your team? Of course. So first, we encourage people to, um, uh, to go ahead and submit their online application first and foremost. Uh, our online application is fairly straightforward. We're asking for your personal data and uh, we're asking also uh, for uh, your essays. So once you've submitted those, that's when we actually open a file for you. Um, and in that file go all of the supplemental documentation that you send us along the way. All of that documentation can be sent in electronic form, at least during the course of the evaluation process. So we might ask for some originals a little bit later on once you've been admitted to the program. Uh, once we have a complete file, so your online application, your recommendation letters, uh, your university transcripts, uh, your, your essays, uh, that's when we take you to our admissions committee. Uh, every single application will be read by one of our associate admissions directors. We divide our responsibilities regionally. So for example, my region is Western Europe. Uh, I'm looking at all the candidates that are coming in from that part of the world. And the file is presented to our admissions committee. Uh, our admissions committee makes uh, a binary decision, which is either interview or not interview. Uh, if you're not invited to interview, your process is then over. If you're invited to interview, uh, you will be contacted by one of our associate directors and have the option of either interviewing here uh, on our campus in Barcelona or interviewing at one of the many events that we do uh, around the world. Uh, people who've taken a look at our events calendar or who take a look at it, you'll see that we are traveling quite often uh, and at different points of the globe at least two or three times during the course of the year. Even in some exceptional uh, cases, we will do interviews by Skype if somebody's unavailable to travel and meet us. But because of the importance of this group chemistry in the collaborative MBA environment, we put a high priority on getting a chance to meet our candidates in person. Once you've conducted your interview, uh, there will be an interview report which is compiled by your interviewer. That goes together with your file back to the admissions committee and a final decision is made uh, whether to admit, not to admit, or in some uh, exceptional cases to put somebody on a wait list. And all in all, between sending us your completed application to when you've been interviewed and you've gotten a final decision, it's usually about a four to five week process. Oh, that's very quick. And those interviews are done by alumni or, or you know, the associate directors of admission? Those interviews are all done by someone who sits on the admissions committee. 
Do candidates have a better chance if they apply earlier, like say in your first uh, three or four deadlines, application deadlines versus the last one? Candidates usually have a better chance applying early. We, we try to schedule our deadlines so that we're taking in an equal number of candidates in every single round. Uh, but, but usually folks who, uh, who apply early tend to have a better, uh, a better possibility because the bulk of applications comes in during those middle months. Huh. And in terms of the GMAT, does Asade have a minimum score? Uh, Isade does not have a minimum score on the GMAT, uh, but we have an average, which is 670. The, the middle the middle 80% range of that can be anywhere from the low 600s all the way up to the high 700s. And so while we don't have a minimum, certainly we try to encourage candidates to get as close to that average as possible. Got it. That's crystal clear. And what three things would you suggest applicants to keep in mind when they're applying to Assad to give themselves the best chance um, of admission? I would first of all uh, recommend that they know how to express their, their profile in a very concise way. We're already judging you on your communication skills from the moment we read the very first line of your essay. And so uh, make sure that you're, that you're giving a picture of yourself that is, that is faithful to who you are and that is also uh, well communicated and well put forward. Uh, I'd encourage them also to make sure that they that they know the university very well, and that you're that you're transparent uh, about what your sort of doubts are or about your priorities, because it's always helpful for us to know exactly where a candidate is in his or her decision making process. We recognize that we have a decision making process about whether we think you are fit for a sale, but you're also making a decision making process of whether the school is a fit for your goals. And so that conversation is more likely to come to a positive outcome if all parties are, are very transparent about it along the way. And finally, I'd really encourage uh, candidates to reach out to former and current current students of our program. We think that we think the world of our of our students, we think that they are uh, among the best assets that we have uh, as a program. And uh, we think that the best way you can learn about the Asadi MBA experience is to talk to somebody who's been through it uh, themselves. And so most of our students are very receptive about being contacted not only through admissions, but even through platforms like LinkedIn. If you do a search, uh, an advanced search with Asadi in the education field, uh, you can find somebody who might be a, a direct or a secondary contact of yours who studied at the school or who might live near where you live. And go ahead and reach out to them. Uh, chances are, if you explain to them that you're interested in Asadi, uh, they'd be willing to take some time to be able to answer questions for you. Great. So you would recommend uh, getting in contact with the admissions office or um, finding them through you know the diff various social media platforms to get in touch with exactly. students. Okay, I'd I'd say use LinkedIn as your as your starting point. Uh, look for somebody who has a particular profile, or if there are any specific uh, needs uh, that you might have, uh, go ahead and look for that profile first. And depending on whether you find what you're looking for, then reach out to us in admissions, and we're always happy to help as well. Yeah, and, and I agree. I think LinkedIn is a very powerful tool for MBA candidates. Um, you can go to different school networks and actually see a breakdown of you know where uh, alumni are working and what industries they're in. So um, it's just a super useful tool to meet uh, MBA students from your target schools. So Keegan, if we could talk about financing the Asade um, MBA, what, what percentage of your class gets scholarships and, and what are your average scholarship amounts? So uh, people finance their MBA obviously through a number of different for, uh, forms, um, uh, loans, personal savings, family contributions often make a much larger percentage than, uh, than one might imagine. Uh, and then scholarship are also a really important component. At Asade, about one third of any given class uh, receive some form of scholarship from the university. And our scholarships can range in amount from anywhere between 5,000 euro all the way up uh, to about 20,000 euros. So we're talking about anywhere from uh, 10 to uh, about 25% of, uh, of the cost of the program. And those scholarships are awarded along with the offers or do you know, candidates have to apply for those scholarships after gaining admission? 
Some scholarships are awarded together with the offer uh, that you receive your admissions letter and in that letter already comes an offer of a scholarship. For those people who do not receive that type of offer, you can also apply to one of the merit scholarships uh, which uh, are, are posted on our website. And there uh, we encourage people to um, make sure you've submitted that within just a couple of days of receiving your offer. So obviously that gives us time to get back to you before you make your final decision, taking all, fa uh, all factors into account. And how can applicants improve their chances uh, of winning a scholarship? Is, would you have any advice there? So uh, first of all, I would encourage uh, applicants to uh, make sure that they've given the best of themselves or they've given their very best in, uh, in, their, in their application. Make sure that you are really making clear why you stand out as a candidate, uh, a different candidate from any of the other ones who might seem on paper to have a similar profile as yours. It's also important to be transparent about the issue of scholarships from the very beginning so that we know if that's a factor that's going to go into your decision making that that can be taken into account. Uh, it's also important uh, to make sure that you've done well on your standardized test, whether it's your GMAT or your GRE. There are a lot of students who apply for scholarship and one of the, uh, the most basic factors which is often used as a, um, as a tiebreaker between candidates is who did better on their, on their test scores. And so uh, important to keep all of that in mind. What would be a, a target GRE score? So a target GRE, um, uh, they, it's the, there's no overall score on the GRE, so you've got one in each, in each section. We obviously would like to see people who are scoring close to 160 uh, on each of the two primary sections, the quantitative and the verbal. Uh, although I should also say this is the very first uh, year in which we're accepting the GRE. And so at the end of this year, we're going to be doing a full review of exactly how our different candidates scored on the GRE and whether that uh, would lead to us publishing uh, maybe some kind of an average, which we don't currently have uh, for, for our class. If, um, say, a candidate is considering a SADE, do you guys have uh, a pre-application process or like if a candidate could you know, submit a profile to you and say, you know, do you think I'm a good fit for the school? The best thing to do in that case would be to try to reach out to one of our associate directors. Um, uh, and there are certain times of the year where it's probably uh, best to be doing that. Uh, we're, we're still at the point where uh, we're just finalizing from the late applying regions our, um, uh, our series of applications. And starting in, in August, September is when we're out looking for the class that will begin in 2014 here. And so uh, if you do want to get a profile assessment, I'd really encourage you to try to reach out to one of our associate directors early. Get, get your CV in front of them. Give any other relevant details about your profile in a very brief introductory email. And at that point, they can usually get back to you with some feedback about what your strong points might be, uh, what your weak points might be, and some areas that you might need to improve if you're going to submit a successful application to our program. And in terms of loan options for international students, can they get loans at uh, Spanish banks? We, we do have a number of partner banks that, that offer loans to ESADE MBA students, regardless of their nationality. One of the things that our partner banks have learned over the years is the value of an ESADE MBA in terms of the salary increase and the job performance of people who pass through these halls. And so, so they, are, they are willing to, to, to give that kind of a loan opportunity. Uh, the loans through these partner banks are approved at about a 95% success rate. So uh, although, yeah, that's, that's not guaranteed financing, but in today's financial climate, it's uh, about the closest thing to guaranteed financing you can find. And so, so and those loans can cover up to 50% uh, of your of your tuition at Asade. And if you happen to have some kind of a, a co-signer or a bank guarantee from your own country, those can cover up to 100% of tuition. Well, I think that's a, a great opportunity because not, not a lot of local banks are willing to give loans to international students. In the case of Asade, they've, they've gotten to know the, the historic performance of our students over the years, and, and that's one of the reasons why they're willing to, um, to make that investment. Of course, the major concern MBA candidates have is, and, and am I going to be able to land a, you know, a great job coming out of um, this MBA program? So uh, we talked briefly about how many, of, many graduates of ESADE end up working outside Spain, but what can you say to applicants who are concerned about 
getting jobs, you know, after they graduate? I, the, the first thing I would say is that um, an MBA is an asset that you'll have with you for the rest of your career. Uh, an MBA for Masade has only increased in value over the course of the past few years and uh, our, our improving placement numbers uh, are a sign of that. Uh, as I mentioned, 93% uh, of our, our graduating class from 2012 had a job within three months of graduation, which is the typical window in which these things are measured. The career progression as measured by um, uh, salary and job title, uh, we were actually ranked number three in the world by the Financial Times in their most recent international MBA rankings. So Asade students make a considerable leap from their pre-MBA position to their post-MBA experience. And so it's, it's really an investment in yourself and an investment that not only in the long term, but even in the short term can, uh, can, can pay off considerably. Yeah, so Asade was ranked third best program for career progress in the world um, by Financial Times, you know, along with being ranked third um, in terms of having the best course experience. So those are, are, are two really good rankings for the program. Is there a stereotype of the Asade student in the corporate community? Yeah, so the, the, uh, instead of giving you a stereotype, I might actually tell a really brief anecdote. Um, we have uh, a, lo a number of really great uh, companies that are recruiting here on a regular basis. And uh, there was one in particular uh, that was, it's an American company, but that recruits for one of its European headquarters here. And um, one of our students started an internship there a couple of years ago. And uh, he saw that there were a number of his classmates that were uh, being recruited by Asade. Uh, and he said, why is it that you guys recruit so heavily at, at Asade Business School? And his manager for that summer said, uh, I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, we recruit MBAs from all around the world. Uh, and I've typically seen MBAs who show up on their very first day of, uh, of the internship. They're given their desk, they're given their laptop, and they sit down at their desk, um, begin an analysis of a particular project or a business situation that they've been presented with. And after about two weeks, they um, present the findings of that analysis to a group of people in the office whom they may not have ever had a chance to meet before uh, uh, during their first two weeks of the internship. He said Asade students consistently get their laptop, put it down on the desk, stand up and go around and introduce themselves to people in their work area. Um, they make sure that they know the people around them. They make sure that they know the dynamics and the, uh, the insights that come from communicating with your, your, your coworkers and your colleagues. And they use those insights and those relationships to then inform all of the work that they do during the course of the rest of their internship. That's, that's a great, great story. So maybe that's a result of, you know, all the teamwork and, and you know, working with, so, with people from so many different countries during the MBA program. In, in, in your site, you mentioned that your career services team, you know, gives unparalleled personal attention to students. And that phrase really stuck out to me. So, I'd, you know, if possible, could you unpack that, what you mean by, you know, unparalleled personal attention? Of course. So um, our career services department um, uh, is a number of great individuals with really strong relationships with companies in different sectors and across the globe. Um, when you're part of the Asade full-time MBA, uh, you are part of uh, an elite group that has access to career services, uh, allowing you an opportunity to really stand out from uh, programs where perhaps you don't get enough face time uh, or enough contact with your career services uh, departments and the companies that they're, uh, that they're in touch with. Our career services folks are in touch with you before you start uh, here on campus, usually within three months uh, before your MBA experience even begins. Uh, they produce some great material uh, such as a short CV book, a long CV book, which is given to every single company that we come into contact with. And they take the opportunity to sit down with every student and come up with a personalized strategy, which includes not only what they can offer as career services, but some insights into how you can leverage your own network and your own contacts to be able to find really good internship and job opportunities along the way. And so uh, we consider it to be unparalleled in that 
uh, you're going to have a lot of resources available to you uh, given the size of the class that you're part of. You're going to have a really wide portfolio of companies uh, that, uh, that you're in contact with, not just at job fairs or on campus presentations, but through uh, the job listings and the uh, information that is sent every single week to us by companies. And finally, that you get the opportunity to really personalize your career search strategy and follow through with it on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And how long can graduates stay in Spain after the program, you know, if for whatever reason they haven't uh, been able to found, find a job yet? So normally, it obviously it depends on the nationality of the graduate. What everyone has, um, regardless of your nationality, is the rights to do a summer internship in Spain as part of your student visa. And usually most student visas last anywhere between uh, three to six months after you've graduated from the program. And so uh, many people will stay here if they graduate in April all the way through that calendar year, uh, either doing a continuation of an internship or uh, beginning a job, or in some cases using Barcelona as a platform from which to continue their job search. You've been working now for two years in, in the admissions office, and of course you, you went to Asada as a student. So, you know, is there anything else about the Asada MBA that you just wish more candidates knew about? I think, uh, I think it would really be great for people to understand just what uh, what a difference it makes to be in an MBA where people are uh, looking out for one another, where they are using their networks, where they're using their knowledge. They're making sure that everybody in the class is learning uh, at a similar pace and people aren't lagging behind. They're making sure that uh, they become active participants in your job search uh, as well as you become active participants in theirs. That, that really, uh, you're, you're not alone when you're an MBA student at Asade. You've got a community of people who is always looking to add value to your experience and to have you add value to theirs. And I think it's that same spirit that lasts not only through uh, the entire MBA experience, but through the alumni network uh, well beyond graduation. Yeah, it sounds very much like a family, Absolutely. the way you describe it. Absolutely. And, and when you speak to uh, current and, and former students, and that's why I really encourage it, candidates to do that, uh, that usually shines through even, even more than just what I'm able to say here. Finally, what three words would you use to describe the program? I would say without a doubt, um, uh, career progression, that it's really a, an MBA that can make you uh, uh, take a great leap in your career. I would say uh, international diversity. I know those are two words. It's a place where you really will be put in with people whose profiles are very, very different from yours. And finally, collaborative, uh, that it's a program where you're going to be asked to contribute as much as you take away uh, in order to have everyone have a better experience. Keegan, thank you so much uh, for being on the program. Um, it was a pleasure having you on the show. Darren, it's been a pleasure to be here, and uh, we hope to, uh, to see you and hopefully some of your listeners in Barcelona sometime soon. Sounds good. All right, thanks a lot. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Touch MBA podcast. Don't be shy. We have a mailing list. Go to touchmba.com and get yourself signed up. And we'll keep you posted with the best tips and insider interviews on how to get into your number one school. You can also find us on Twitter and Facebook at Touch MBA. See you soon.